Kent Grant to the Ontario Geological Society's September meeting. We wish to thank the Coburn District Historical Museum for hosting us. That was very, very generous and we truly appreciate it. Um, before, I, well, this is my note I had. Before we begin, I need to tell you that we're live streaming, but we are not live streaming anymore. <laughs> um, but Michelle will record the meeting for our members and then we will upload it to our, our YouTube channel that we have, and then folks can go back and watch it later. Even you folks can go back and watch it later if there's something that you miss or want to listen to again. Um, so let's begin. How many of you have heard of the Ontario Genealogical Society? The members don't count. <laughs> so it seems like there's some folks here that have never heard of the Ontario Genealogical Society, OGS for short. Um, um, OGS has been preserving and promoting family history all across Ontario for over 50 years. Um, there's over 30 branches and a few special interest groups all across Ontario. If you look in the red uh, pamphlet that kind of tells you a little bit about OGS, um, the website's there. There's quite a lot of information in there that um, uh, what the society does, mem member benefits, and just a lot of great information, and their website's on there. And the website's free and open to the public, anybody can check it out. So we are one of those branches that I mentioned of the Ontario Theological Society, we're the Essex branch, because we're in Essex County. So there's also one in Kent County, and Lambton, and Norfolk, Haldimand, all across. Um, we also have monthly meetings, and this was supposed to be our September monthly meeting, we usually hold it in the Windsor Public Library, um, on the lower level. <laughs> we have a meeting once a month. Um, we get together and we talk about family history and we bring in different speakers. Um, this is the first time that we have basically taken our meeting on the road, like the genealogy road show. Um, we thought, since we're always centrally located in Windsor, a lot of the people who live in the county don't always get to, a chance to come to our meetings or to come in. So we thought we'd try to go out into the community and thus, here we are in Comber. Maybe next time we'll go to Amherstburg. Or we just thought we'd give it a try and see how receptive it was and how it worked. So that's why we're here. Um, also, we have uh, we have a great website. We have newsletters that we give our, our members. Um, we do mentoring. It's mainly main, our main focus is on Essex County, but we do assist people and point them in the direction if they have ancestors or doing research anywhere else in Ontario and the world for that matter. Um, this is our rack card. They're also on the table, and there's a, uh, a table over there with all these pamphlets as well. They give you more of the information about our branch, our website, our Facebook group, um, and a bit of the information. Um, we do have a family history uh, library collection, and uh, some of our publications are over here. Um, these publications would love to find a new home, so if you're looking at them and you find an ancestor or something that you're interested in, not these books, these are the common books. But any of these hard copies, <coughs> and you feel you can give them a home, feel free to take them with you. Um, but like I can see, our collection is on the second floor of the Windsor Public Library. They have just created a new um, family history and history. Oh, local, history. local history room. So it's that new glass in the area. So our, a lot of our collection is in there combined with the Windsor Public Library's collection. Previously, our collection was here and some of theirs were there and it's kind of scattered. So they've taken all the family history resources and put them in one room. And again, that's open to the public uh, during library hours. Um, I mentioned our monthly meetings. Um, there's, there's a flyer that Michelle, who's our publicity person, has done the flyer of the next few meetings that we're having. So feel free to take one of them with you. Um, Chris Carter is going to be speaking at our October meeting. Um, our meetings are typically on a Monday night, but since it's Thanksgiving holiday, they're bumping it over to Tuesday. So we're back at the Windsor Public Library. And Chris Carter, I'm sure if anybody knows Chris, he's a local historian, um, reenactor. So he's going to come out and talk about some of the early... Um, Essex County settlers. And then in November, we have Deborah Honor. I don't know if anyone knows Deborah. She is a wealth of knowledge and the go to person for anything um, military in the area, War of 1812. Um, she, they, her and her husband have honors bed and breakfast, and her husband um, was a curator at Fort Malden. I think he was the curator. And he's retired now. So between the two of them, they have a wealth of knowledge. Like I said, those are the next few meetings, and you're all welcome to come out with them. Um, 
we brought with us tonight, as I was saying, a few of our publications that need to find a new home, um, lots of pamphlets and local, other local groups. We like to network and connect and support other groups, so a lot of their um, information and pamphlets are on that table over there. We also brought with us some of our scanning equipment. That's something new that we've undertaken in the last couple of years with everybody going digital and to try to preserve and make um, the information more accessible. We begin to scan a lot of our uh, fragile documents, old documents, one of a kind documents, because sometimes they go walking off the shelves and they don't return. So if you'd like to see afterwards how our scanning um, equipment works, we will give you a demonstration afterwards. Um, so Mr. and Mrs. Mallow and Mr. McCracken have Brent graciously offered to give us a tour of this wonderful museum. Um, along the way, I'm sure they'll answer any questions that you might have. Um, be sure at the very um, front door there's a guest book there. Be sure to sign into the guest book and if you feel so inclined, they truly appreciate any donations you might have. And this is their new and improved or reprinted Comber Through the Years. It's also for sale. And I guess I will turn things over. Yes. I was going to say, I started it on a tenant's sheet. Okay. You did never sign in a sheet. Sure. And if, if at any point in time, we have a sign in sheet. If you feel that you would like more information or uh, an email of when we're going or what we're doing, definitely give us your email because we have a list on the go of not just members, but people in the community who just want to know what's happening with us and where we're going to be next and what's going on. So feel free to leave us your email as well. Any questions about OGS or the Essex branch in particular or what we do? I tried to talk real fast, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think just uh, one word for me. Uh, I have a, I take care of the library. I'm kind of new at it, so I, I'm not a wealth of knowledge the way the former librarian was. And I do like to do research. It's, it's something I really enjoy. So if you have any questions that you're hitting a brick wall, or if there's something I can help you with, uh, just if you write to essex at ogs.ontario.ca, if you ask a question, it'll get to me. And I'll be glad to help out with anybody who's looking for someone. Yeah. That's Kent Branch and Chatham. They also have a branch there. They have a library collection inside the Chatham Public Library. Same type of deal. They have a great website. They have a Facebook group you can join and ask a question. Um, there are always a OGS like slash Kent. Kent. Exactly. So even if you go to the main OGS website and you click on branches, it will tell you all the branches that there are. And then it will send you the link to that branch. It'll take you right to their website as well. So maybe, uh, just I'll just briefly introduce Pat Clancy. She's our cemetery coordinator for the branch. Linda Urquhart, she does our research and she's our librarian. David Hutchinson at the back is our web fella. <laughs> and then Michelle Watson, she's our publicity, also our tech web assistant. And I'm Cindy Robichaud, I'm the newsletter editor. Well, welcome and thank you all for coming very, very much. This is great. So I'll turn it over now to the folks at the museum. I don't know how you like to proceed. If you just want a one long train out there, or you want to say something first. Well, I wonder how it would work if certain ones of us were in certain areas and just like to crawl through and ask us questions. I don't think you'd want to trail behind us on the conductive tour. Sure, well, that sounds idea. great. Well, we should introduce ourselves, I guess, first. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I'm the past president of the Comber Historical Society. This is Bob McCracken. I have my wife, Joan, over there. Who has been? Well, as much president as me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there's water over there. There's a little French and guy in there. It's cold water and maybe there's other water too. If anybody wants water, help yourself or if the rain can maybe juice boxes. Juice boxes? Juice boxes? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so now, how do you want to go about this tour? Do you just want to you, do you just want to wander through and if one of us is is around just ask us questions? Uh, what, what what would you like to do? How would you like to do it? It's so big that it's kind of hard to take a group that you'd be 
trail and you wave behind. <laughs> we so found that with the school children, that, that didn't work. To, yeah, we tried that, that and it just didn't work to take a, take a group through. They ended up just kind of scattered around. Yeah. So, Can you break us into smaller groups? So yeah, that, yes. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, Judy's here too, and uh, uh, <laughs> Daniel, that could take a group through, that knows something about the museum. So. And any questions that you have that I can answer, uh, maybe I should kind of tell you something about the museum. Uh, this museum was started, okay, let's go back, the country schools, all joined in with the Centennial Central School at Long There was three, four schools, three schools. Dave, Dinefield, Maple Grove, and this one, four schools. And they all started into the Centennial School in Congress. So this school was closed. It originated, the last class was in 1964. So in 1967, there was a grant available from the to start a centennial project. So that was what Tilbury West Township did as their project. And there's information up at the front about that. Well then, it accumulated stuff for several years and we had a curator, who was Stan, Stanley Ford, was curator until he passed on. And then uh, Jim Rosen took over at that time as president, or <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> anyway, uh, when the amalgamation took place with Tilbury West, Tilbury Wood North, Rochester, and uh, Bell River, uh, we had a meeting amongst some of our members in the community, and we thought maybe we better take this out of Lakeshore's hands because at that time they were closing all the municipal offices. The road departments and, uh, well, they left the fire department, but is that true, Judy? So we thought maybe if we could start this as a more or less a private uh, museum would be a better idea. And it has worked very well. We've uh, fought with Lakeshore Council a few times because they wanted to close it. They wanted to close this up and move it somewhere near Bell River, which is not what we want with this type of museum. So anyway, <laughs> here we are today, and uh, it's working quite well. We get a grant from Lakeshore every year. We also uh, are members of the Ontario, Municip Ontario Museum Association, and we get a small amount of money donated from them every year. We have to apply for it. There's a, there's a fund available and uh, they divide that up amongst whatever museums qualify and we have to be one. So we get that every year. Then our donations at the door and uh, that's how we support this thing with a lot of hard work. <laughs> we also have a memorial forest in the ground, we have uh, an acre and three quarters property here. So we have a memorial forest where if someone wants to uh, donate a tree, they can do that and the tree would be planted. And we have a plaque in the other part that we put a gold plate on with the name of the person who had donated, the tree was donated for. Uh, Anybody have any questions that I can help with? How big is your membership, approximately? <laughs> Our secretary treasurer isn't here. <laughs> <laughs> it's more. I would say we have probably, I think we sent out 60, 60 some memberships and that's family memberships. And our membership is still ten dollars, I guess. No, it's fifteen dollars. The membership is fifteen dollars.
it used to be 10. And everything went up. And with that, you get a membership card. And we have a, a gold pin with uh, the picture of the museum on it. And that would go with the membership. We have some here, in fact. It's a membership card. I think we have the pins that we mark as those. I guess I've talked long enough. Great. Fantastic. Do you have anything you want to ask me? No. Not really. I think you've covered the old history quite well. <laughs> Something that uh, uh, I have uh, a lot of deep feelings for this museum because my father and mother, my aunt, my sister and brother, two of my children went to school here. <laughs> So how about big kids? Can they get in there too and get their picture taken? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can get in. <laughs> so I'll even take the uh, picture. We face a uh, covered wagon, um, the kinds of wagons that would have gone out west. Well, uh, I shouldn't even admit this to you. Whatever possessed me to do to build a prairie schooner, I don't know. <laughs> In Canada, I keep telling them, anybody asks me, I just keep telling them it's a mental illness that I have. <laughs> I'd be a little crazy to build something like that. But a prairie schooner actually wasn't used in Canada much. We did have a few covered wagons, but prairie schooners was totally uh, Oregon Trail because they made them the shape of a boat for two reasons. The one reason was because everything uh, jiggled to the center as they went through all the rocky, you know. And another reason was that sometimes they had to take the wheels off them and dumb dumb them up with tire and float them across the rivers. And they said sometimes there's only about two inches of freeboard when they took them across, across the river. Two or three times in the Oregon Trail they had to cross the river. So we used uh, uh, covered wagons a bit here in Canada, but not a whole lot. Remember, our west was settled by the CPR Railroad. Eh? We didn't do it just the same as the states did. Ours was just a little different thing. We lean more towards stagecoaches, probably partly because of coal country, too. Stagecoach, you did have a little protection. Stagecoach is real common here. There used to be stagecoaches that even went from Windsor to Toronto before the railroads went through. And then after the railroads went through, why the stagecoaches just went from the railroad depot out into the country or places where there wasn't rails. So, so actually the stagecoach is really more Canadian than the prairie schooner. Bob also has made uh, two princess coaches. Yeah, I've got two uh, pumpkins made that's uh, Cinderella coaches. <laughs> that's his retired one. <laughs> I have six carriages. <laughs> is there a difference between a prairie schooner and a palm wagon? Like, is there a size difference? Or is there well, kind of Stoga wagon. No, I wouldn't say there's a difference in size. Kind of Stoga wagon actually was American, too. <laughs> but... Uh, but I, I was just I'm in yeah. the process of reading a book um, mm -hmm. related to um, it's actually uh, all the plain folks on Mennonites and mm -hmm. um, a whole bunch of the, the mm -hmm. different li religious sects mm -hmm. moving up from Pennsylvania and New York and New Jersey mm -hmm. here and some of them certainly were using Conestoga wagons. Yeah. So. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say they're basically the same. You see, they, they give it the name Prairie Schooner because the, the Conestoga wagon just didn't have the shape to it. Conestoga wagon could be a covered wagon, couldn't right. it? It was, yeah. it was a covered wagon. Yeah. yeah. They, they actually but basically, the wagons are the same. The wheels, the axles, all those wooden wheeled wagons, whether they were made here in the States or whatever, was basically that same uh, wheel and axle and 
and wagon fire. It's just however they built this top piece. If you can see that wagon is back over there, you can tell how much bigger those wheels are. And they were made for a purpose because a lot of times the ruts got so deep that the bottom of the wagon would drag and they made a higher wheel wagon for that purpose. And that's one of the frame there. A lantern out oh, west told me that there's still marks in the ground where people follow yep. along. Yeah, yeah. They're still there. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. See, they took, uh, on, uh, well, we're getting into American history now, but uh, the Oregon Trail, they had to start early in the spring because they had to have 200 days. And if they weren't making 10 hours a day, they were in trouble. They had to get, you know, and uh, they went by oxen, and very few people rode in the prairie schooners. Uh, maybe a woman, if she was pregnant, maybe, or it was so rough, usually they walked it. You didn't drive oxen like you drove horses with lines. You just sort of guided them along. And they used mostly oxen. Uh, the reason they used oxen was the fact that you could forage an oxen quite easy, where, uh, uh, well, horse, the Americans used mules more than horses. Even mules, when they first started the Oregon Trail, wasn't very uh, good because uh, a mule couldn't forage the same and a little more high strung. And then, too, if things got too bad, you could eat an oxygen, and I don't think anybody wanted to eat a mule. I don't think you'd stick a fork in the gravy if you had to try to eat a mule. So there was there was two reasons for it. They maybe start out with six oxen, and along the way they would find that they had way too much stuff with them, and they'd have to jettison some of it off, and uh, the oxen would start to wear out, and maybe they'd have to they end up when they got to Oregon City, which now is the uh, suburb of Portland, and uh, they would probably maybe only have two oxen left. So, first people to go was the Mormons, and they went north of the rivers, and they didn't go to Oregon City, though. They went down to Salt Lake City, and they're still there. <laughs> they were the first people to go on the Oregon Trail. I'm getting way off in American history. <laughs> It's very interesting. I really enjoy myself. Questions? Any more questions? Bob has pretty much everything in that that they would have taken with them. Yeah, that that is the way it would have been. Just about like that. He has, uh, if you can see... Possibly this. they just... Oh, no, go ahead. About the little stove on the side hanging underneath and their water tank that they, mm -hmm. that they took with them. Mm -hmm. See, they had to gather food for those oxen as they went along. You couldn't take food with you for the ox oxen. Oh, they'd have some tough times at times going through prairie-type situations, through mountain situations. It, it would be a tough. People died along the way. They, they, they went to get away from cholera more than they did tough times. Everybody thinks that they're very poor people. It wasn't. You had to be a middle-class person to take a prairie schooner because you had to be able to stock the prairie schooner. You had to be able to buy five or six oxen. It wasn't wasn't very poor people that went. Anyway, I, I got away from the thing again. Ask, ask me questions. That'll work better. I just wondered about the school. Do you have the original school records or before there are some copies, some big books up in the back here, or in the front, I should say, of some of the records, yes, but not, not an awful lot, really. I don't know where those went when they closed up the schools. They <laughs> probably went in the trash bill. <laughs> and the hey, people didn't the treasure things thing the way they did later. The same thing as the bell. <laughs> we have no idea where it went. Well, when I went to school here, there was no, there was no bell. I was no bell free. No, no. The teacher just come out and shook the hand bell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do they still have scrap? 
I managed to get one strap in from each teacher. So she was there, I would just keep keep pushing the thing, pushing the thing till finally I stepped over the line. <laughs> you know? I think I heard Lyle say what she found real good was just to put the strap out on the desk. <laughs> that seemed to work quite well. <laughs> When I was making introductions, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you that Claudia was the secretary here. And at all time, the lead operator was the until Mark took over. And then we had a new secretary. And both her and I retired at the same time. Secretary Frazier. <laughs> that was a choice. Yeah. <laughs> and when and we had meetings, in those days, we had to do all our paperwork. Was all on paper. I think we have a question back. We got a question back here. She's just waving her hand. No, I think she's oh, so okay. excited. She has to get the sheet. Okay. okay. Well, if we all want to determine the question. We got a question, question back here. Those uh, desks that are up in the front corner, uh, if you come in the door on, on the right, are, are those original from the school itself? They seem so small. <laughs> yeah, I thought the same thing when I looked at that. And I sat and I tried it again. Another thing you got to remember is in early, early times, people were smaller than they are today, too. Yeah. So when I built that <laughs> stagecoach, I sat down to figure out how to build it. I sat down on a chair and I figured everything they built in those days, they always allowed a lot of room. Measured how high it had to be. And I measured how long it had to be because uh, I'd heard them say that when they went on the stagecoach at their knees, and they said sometimes the men's knees went between the women didn't like that. I said, well, it just depends. Some did, some didn't. <laughs> and when I got the stagecoach, uh, I found before I finished a stagecoach that a person had bought in the States and an original stage goes and I went and measured it and I found I was six inches longer and six inches higher. I forgot to consider the fact that people people were smaller. Mm -hmm. If you, do you ever look at the British Army uniform to see it looked like the shoulders were that wide? It's hard to imagine that people were that much smaller, but they were. Yeah, when I was a kid, a six foot tall man, oh my gosh, he's six feet tall. Today, all, all my grandchildren. <laughs> okay. Do you want to take a look at There's some pictures on the wall that are way high, and I wondered if I would be able to get a copy of those pictures. George uh, Taylor? Can you, have you got a camera? Or? Yeah. But I can't get up there because they're too high for me. Well, maybe Daniel is very tall. Oh, you can If you will do that for her. You're from the Taylor family, right? She did. You're from the George Taylor family? Uh, no, but I'm from Samuel Taylor's brother's family. So, We're from, I'm from the Taylor family on the other side of the tracks. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm from the Taylor family on the opposite side because I thought I was from the Comber Taylor, Sam, Samuel Taylor, until I came and realized they were from England. Okay. And from Ireland. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, I'll get you just because <laughs> that, would be, that would be one of the original families in Comber. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Samuel Taylor. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He donated property yeah. for the churches there and for the, well, I think the fairgrounds even. He owned a, a, a whole block there, lot six. And he owned that whole block. And then when the railway comes through, it split it. Yeah. Well, my great grandmother was Emily Taylor, Thomas Taylor. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Emily Thomas, John Edmund, and then. Samuel Taylor first. See, when my family came into this country, this part of the country, that railway wasn't through Conver yet. They had to come, they had to come and settled in the Toronto area where the airport is, actually. And they had to go to Stony Point on okay. the train. Then they could hire uh, horses and wagon and come over to this 10th concession, the first road here. And he bought 100 acres from the Crown on the other, Gracie? On the Strict County Road 37, 
And it was all bush all through here. It was all bush. The roads weren't even cut through all the way. Something else kind of interesting in the Maple Grove Church, and the deed to, to it, William and Mary Clydesdale gave the money, and neither one could sign and said, William Clydesdale, his mark. With the <coughs> and even the axe was just Mary Clydesdale, her mark. So many people couldn't, could, couldn't even sign their own name. So you mentioned the Clydesdale, and you mentioned the Taylors being one of So are there some other... Uh, local families that you can recall that would have been early settlers of the Comber area? Well, my my family. So the Mallows? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In 19... Uh, I don't know what year they came. It's in our record somewhere. What year they moved from England, Cornwall, England, to Quebec. I suppose that was where they landed on the ships. And then they moved from Quebec into uh, Albion Township, which is where the airport is in Toronto. And uh, my great-grandfather then separated from his family. He had property there, farms, and met his wife, and she was a roadhouse. And there are still roadhouses related distantly to us here. Well then, he came down here for two, two summers, come by train, and he was able to rent a wagon and a, and a team of horses from someone, because Stone Point area was settled earlier. A lot of French uh, people settled along the lake at Stony Point area. And he then come in here for, I understood, for two years, two summers, and cleared land and built a log cabin. Well, then, uh, 74, 1974, he brought his wife and family from Toronto and moved down here. So that was the start of that. And uh, he had quite a lot of land. He was very well off. He had about 600 acres. And at that time, it was quite a bit of land. Was that 1874? 1874. You said 1974. <laughs> 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 no. 1874. Something, something else a little interesting. They never thought that this part of the country would ever be farmed because it was so wet. Uh, it never dried up here until about June. And after they logged it off, after the sawmills had logged off the good timber, why well, you had fields of stumps, and it didn't dry up till June, and you could get them by the land for just practically nothing because they had a little bit of taxes to pay on it. Well, they were the glad to get rid of it. The crowd it. Yeah, and then, and then they started uh, getting some of the islands and some of the debris out of uh, Big Creek and the Ruscom River and started to drain up a little, and they began to realize that, that it could be farmed. And then the stumps got a little older, got so they could, and they cleared it little bits at a time. I don't know the OC, they made a little three corner harrow so they slide around the stumps, and they, they worked it with oxen because an oxen would go around the stump where a horse would step over it. They thought that they could never work it with horses because, and, and they, they just, a little bit by bit until they, until they cleared they, it. They uh, used a huge big steam operated drag line and cleaned the big creek yeah. from, mm -hmm. from uh, the lighthouse area right up to 8th uh, uh, Concession in Mercy Township. It's County Road 14. Uh, County Road 14 is the 9th. Yeah, 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 probably the 8th. The big yeah. creek starts mm -hmm. there. And once they did that, then they started building the roads, and they dug a ditch along and piled the dirt. The ditches made the roads. The ditches made, made the roads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand you have municipal records as well. I was wondering how far back the records go. For? For, for Comber. For Comber? Uh, there's quite a bit of it in our Comber book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, Comber wasn't there originally. No. Comber was down 98 Highway where the Big Creek is. You know where the Big Creek crosses 98 between Tilbury and Comber? It's two miles east of Comber. Two miles east of 77. That's where John Gracie and McDole, I think her name was McDole. Anyway, they built a, 
uh, the log house down there, the Comber Municipal Office was there until the railway was cut through. When they cut through to, uh, Taylor's property here, they moved that uh, municipal office from there into Comber. And they built a huge big uh, municipal office. It was like three stories tall. There's pictures of it in our Comber book. And uh, they said there was a, enough room in that for 400 people for a, what do they call it, Joan? <laughs> Yeah, a, a theater kind of type of thing. I don't think they called it a theater in those days. It was a, but anyway, and that one burned. And then they they moved uh, from there into Main Street of Conway. There's quite a bit of history in that uh, Conway history book that we wrote. I was just wondering, the archives from Conway kept here at all, or were they, uh, were they kept somewhere else? The history? Yeah, uh, municipal records, archives. Uh, uh, most of it's here, but yeah, what we have. Right. Yeah, we don't have a lot. We, do, we don't have a lot. Yeah. So, for we, we, uh, researcher, that would be interesting. The Women's Institute uh, started collecting history like that, and, and we got those people passed on, and we were given the history that they had written. And we copied it over into this book. So basically, you're going to see most of it in that yeah, book. Yeah, you'll find but most of it in that book. We mm -hmm. Maybe a few tidbits, not, but, but yeah. that basically covers it. And a lot of mm -hmm. pictures. It's good. It's yeah, you wouldn't find a, a lot out of that book, will you? Not really. Not a lot. Mm -hmm. Maybe a few little facts, but. A lot of that stuff was destroyed, eh? Yeah. And, uh, the same yeah. as a lot of the. Stuff you find in your old barns now. <laughs> More questions. What? How much of this area was actually considered Comber then? If it was more to the east, was, well, was Comber the Gracie itself, the start of? No, Comber this area? itself was was a town mm -hmm. or a village. A village, I guess. It was a village. The area was Tilbury West Township. Until, so right from Tilbury over there. It went from, well, actually, uh, let's sing our book. <laughs> 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 we were two years writing that book about mm -hmm. Bob and, and my wife and some other help. Did you ever go on that committee at the club and you the only one? Well, they've, they've changed so many roads and boundaries and everything yeah. you say yeah. in this area, but it might have been something Well, actually, else County Road 8 changed. forms the length of the county. That's always the dividing line yeah. there. And then the Wheatley, Wheatley uh, of course, there you're changing from Essex to Kent, so yeah. that yeah. makes a boundary, too. Yeah. So you've got two positive boundaries there. Okay, so those are like the oldest. Those come from way early yeah. time. Two or two miles, four miles from Highway 77. Is another dividing line that was Tilbury North. Mm -hmm. okay. But at one time, that was all Tilbury West. Yeah. Like it went, the whole thing was included. Then they divided years back. Mm -hmm. I used to say there was three Tilburys at one yeah. time. <laughs> and then Rochester Township was the first road from here. Rochester Township started, and oh. it went to the bottom of the road. Now that's all Lakeshore. Mm -hmm. From Tilbury Town Line okay. and County Road 1. That goes right, right from there to Manning Road. It's all Lakeshore to County Road 8. Right to the lake. People change boundaries. <laughs> it's a huge, big, big uh, area. Yeah. Why they called it a town, I have no idea because we're nowhere near a town. <laughs> You got any questions about uh, we're, we're kind of yeah, about the machinery? If you want to wander around and ask us, or uh, however you would like to do that, we'll try to answer your questions about the machinery. I'm more knowledgeable on machinery than I am the things up front. So am I. But, uh, <laughs> hey, we got, we got lots of people up front too. Anything that you want to ask about, feel free. Yeah, you can see standing around.